So I'll be going over zero trust, multi-cloud and network monitoring. Uh, just a little background on live action. So we started off in the DOD space working with the US Navy and Marines, uh, founded back in 2014. And we got some funding from Cisco and other venture capital firms. And we've done several acquisitions that's pertinent. Uh, and we'll talk about it during this uh, session as well. Uh, so one is Counterflow, which does uh, encrypted traffic analysis, which is of interest in Savius, which does a lot of packet analytics. Uh, just a little background on our company and our product. So we do network performance monitoring uh, across all the different domains of you know, branch, campus, WAN, data center, cloud, multi-cloud, and various telemetry, but it's really you know, vendor agnostic, uh, multi-vendor, entire network, including cloud, and then also uh, various use cases for application performance, but also security. And the topics that I'll be covering um, briefly is zero trust and how it fits with network monitoring and then also network monitoring for multi-cloud. So these are two main topics that we hear a lot from our customers. So first, uh, zero trust and network monitoring. So what's driving the interest for zero trust is the uh, executive order issued by the White House back in May 2021 that I think everybody's familiar with, but it goes over um, about adopting of cloud and cloud services, but also towards zero trust architectures or ZTA. So they have certain uh, recommendations that uh, a lot of the agencies have to adopt. And we've had queries from our customers as well, like how we can help them with these requirements for uh, supporting ZTA, for example. But what is zero trust architecture or ZTA? So the defining document is really, I think the NIST uh, publications. So this is available uh, on the internet. And it goes over the different tenants of ZTA. And uh, it's a lot of it is pretty much common sense. Uh, it's really um, making sure that you, know, you don't necessarily trust anything. Uh, and then if you do provide uh, access to different resources for you know, uh, using the identity to understand what they should be allowed access to and not just uh, across the board, give them uh, more access than required. But also things like you know, making sure there's a, a, a uniform policy and also making sure that uh, you're in a highly secure state and things are encrypted. So it's, it's driving necessity for encrypting things, uh, identity management, uh, and also just not trusting things uh, and don't, don't trust necessarily the network that you're running on as well. So it's kind of more common sense. And then when you look at the NIST document, it talks about three ways to actually deploy uh, zero trust architectures. And these are not um, mutually exclusive and you can use you know, combinations of this. One is definitely uh, pretty common is the enhanced identity governance. So uh, resource access based off of your identity. Uh, Second is micro segmentation. So um, allowing certain applications uh, access to a particular network segment and using policy enforcement points to uh, enforce uh, that particular policy. And then network infrastructure and software defined parameters, which often are called ZTMA. So zero trust uh, network access and kind of like a, a overlay uh, network and you hear you know, various companies providing this, uh, Cisco, Zscalers, and others. And in that document, you know, network monitoring uh, is defined uh, by NIST to inspect all the traffic and logged on the network uh, and aggregate these uh, asset logs, the network traffic as well. So it's actually a requirement uh, to get visibility to what's happening within the network. And the second thing is, uh, encrypted traffic will become harder to analyze. And, and NIST actually calls this out. So talking about you know, uh, alternative ways to uh, decrypting everything, how do you analyze encrypted traffic analysis is actually mentioned in that uh, NIST document and definitely leveraging things like machine learning. And how is the network monitoring relevant to ZTA? There's another document from the DOD uh, published in February, 2021 that talks about the seven zero trust pillars. 
And one of the key pillars is networking and environment, but also visibility and analytics. And if you dig further into the document, it talks about specifically you know, understanding the context and performance uh, of the various pillars, including the network, and providing you know, detection and anomalous behavior uh, capability to make sure and adjust security policies but just general situational awareness of the environment. Um, and per the DOD document, it does talk about capturing and inspecting the traffic. So looking into the packets, accurately dis discovering you know, what kind and types of traffic there are, but primarily to you know, observe if there's any threats and if there is, uh, making sure that you adjust your security posture or orient uh, your various defenses. The second topic that I want to talk about was uh, network monitoring for multi-cloud. So we hear this with all of our customers, the cloud migration and adoption story. So it's been going on for many, many years. And that same White House executive order pushes cloud adoption, which has you know, FedRAMP implications. But there's a lot of aspects to cloud migration. So uh, definitely the multi-cloud aspect, the AWS, Azure, GCP, so we see customers uh, leveraging one primary uh, cloud provider like AWS, and then a secondary for like specific things like analytics that would leverage GCP, for example. But it gets quite complex, even with a single uh, cloud provider, you know, leveraging multiple regions, you might have a Europe and the US and multiple ones in the US, but also the number of accounts. So we've seen DOD contractors you know, leveraging hundreds of accounts just to reduce that blast radius if any one of those gets compromised. Uh, and also leveraging infrastructure as a service. So there's a ton of instances, containers, also platforms as a service as well. So databases, analytics, machine learning. I think you've seen these as well. And then the other aspect of getting visibility on premise and also uh, in the cloud. So a hybrid situation comes up. And then all the various teams that are involved in cloud uh, management, so the DevOps, SRE, SecOps, NetOps. And we tend to see three adoption uh, methodology for cloud. Uh, first is the lift and shift, which is the easiest, is just moving workloads, whether it's VMs or containers, directly from on-premise to the cloud. The second is just building new cloud apps using cloud native capabilities. And the third is, is kind of a mix where you may decompose an existing application, for example, you know, removing the database on premise and leveraging like an RDS service in AWS, for example, and then slowly uh, converting to a, a cloud native uh, approach. So those are different aspects that we hear. And these are the major cloud um, network monitoring use cases uh, that we run into. So definitely the first one is cloud migration. So you know, auditing what they have uh, prior to the migration, just to understand what needs to be migrated. Uh, but a lot of customers are interested in benchmarking the application performance before migration and after, just to see if it improved, got worse or better. Second is just general network and application performance visibility troubleshooting. So uh, understanding application performance in a hybrid scenario becomes quite complex and the traffic path just for connectivity becomes complicated as well, especially in a hybrid situation and there's security and cost implications. So understanding you know, how that traffic uh, goes through on premise and in the cloud uh, becomes very important. And then day two operations and multi-cloud. So you know, the daily reports, alerts, management, uh, sort of like the tier one support personnel would use. And then cost and consumption analysis is pretty key. So uh, cost is one of the, the big issues in uh, adopting cloud. So having the ability to do um, workload analysis, uh, how much traffic is going in and out of ingress and egress. And the last one is security incident res uh, response. So uh, having detailed records uh, of all the different traffic is helpful and also packet level analytics. Uh, becomes key. Um, so benchmarking the application performance pre and post. Uh, and then 
just network and application performance uh, troubleshooting uh, once the cloud is adopted. Uh, application performance for hybrid scenarios and just understanding traffic path because there's just a lot of different ways you can connect uh, uh, cloud services uh, with you know, transit gateways and uh, VPC peering. And they have all security and cost implications and it's not always obvious to people. And then just you know, day two operations uh, in a multi-cloud. And the last one is security incident response. So how do you do that in the cloud, but also in a multi-cloud uh, environment? Uh, so coming to polling question number two, uh, how many of you are being asked to increase visibility into your cloud from a networking perspective? So just curious uh, what you're seeing out there. Okay, so we got the results, uh, yes. Uh, 89% uh, no for uh, one result. So looks like there's a lot of uh, asks from a networking perspective, which is understandable because as people do multi-cloud and like I mentioned, I've seen some customers have like over 900 uh, accounts in AWS, for example, uh, just so that each department or each project have their own accounts. So monitoring that becomes quite a bit of a challenge. So what are those challenges? Uh, and talking to our customers, the goals are, you know, being able to effectively monitor, but avoid tool fall, fall because um, a lot of the cloud team, the DevOps, the SREs, they tend to have their own cloud native uh, observability uh, tools. And then, you know, uh, the NetOps team may have on-premises tools, but it's very difficult to get uh, an end-to-end -end view. So they do want to avoid the tool sprawl and not necessarily the legacy products can do the cloud effectively either. But the second is, you know, being able to leverage between teams. So SecOps, NetOps, DevOps, uh, working together. And a bunch of blind spots uh, come up, especially in a multi uh, cloud service provider visibility. Um, and like I mentioned, there's a lot of ways to connect different services. And a good example is uh, AWS S3, so it's storage services. Uh, you can go through your internet gateway in a VPC to get to your S3. You can put an S3 endpoints in your VPC and it has security and cost implications. So uh, understanding those uh, blind spots. And the network architecture you know, makes it much harder uh, from an on-premise or colo, you know, how are you connecting? Is it direct connect or you know, are you using a VPN gateway, for example? And just the sprawl of your network design, the region, the, the transits, the accounts, and how are you connecting? Are you using SD-WAN or WAN or SASE? So that just kind of complicates uh, some of the networking and you might have to monitor like an SD-WAN system, for example. And trying to get a single view uh, of this uh, is a challenge. So cloud and on-premises, uh, which traditionally does SNMP full and packet, but the cloud side, you got to use cloud native uh, uh, capabilities there. So you know, having a mix of uh, capabilities and how do you troubleshoot this effectively uh, for the multiple stakeholders and being able to segment the problem becomes a challenge. And this is some of the ways that we look at cloud networking. So from a cloud, um, there's three primary ways that we get data. And the first one is uh, flow log, or there's some type of API that gives us information about the cloud native uh, networking infrastructure. And this helps us with you know, capacity and network cost and other capabilities, but it really logs all the activity in a particular VNet on the Azure side or a VPC on the AWS side. So we'll see every uh, uh, traffic uh, and it's very similar to um, NetFlow or IPFIX that you're probably familiar with. And the second is packet analytics. So you can put um, a packet capture or packet uh, streaming analytics capability in the cloud and AWS and Azure provide taps to um, send that data to uh, that virtual appliance. 
And that gives us help with the uh, application performance information. So we have customers that do that. And the third one is just a traditional network function virtualization. So if you stick a virtual router or switch or a CSR or C edge in Cisco terminology, you can monitor that uh, as much as you could at, uh, on premise with a hardware device. So it, that doesn't change just because that uh, virtual router is in the cloud. So those are kind of the three primary ways. And on premises, you know, enabling visibility at the WAN edge uh, to see what's going to the cloud. So whether it's a uh, direct connect, uh, whatever the colo provides in terms of uh, cloud connection. And you know, it helps with the end-to-end -end troubleshooting capabilities. So you know, connecting on-premise with the cloud. And the third piece is the SD-WAN. So we see a lot of customers adopting some type of SD-WAN to connect not just their branches and data centers, but also to the cloud. So they may put a C edge, uh, Cisco and other multi-vendors have connections to transit gateways that can connect automatically. But the SD-WAN portion becomes still another black box. So on the right-hand side, you'll see at the top, the cloud, the SD-WAN in the middle and uh, on-premises and colo at the bottom. So having to you know, make sure that you get visibility into the different portions to really you know, troubleshoot and segment the problem. Which brings us to our last polling question. So. Um, I'm curious to hear what you're hearing about, you know, how many different public cloud service providers do you work with or infrastructure as a service, platform as a service capabilities? Um, I'm kind of leaving SaaS out. So I'm, I'm thinking about the major cloud service providers. So AWS, Azure, uh, GCP, uh, IBM. Uh, so how many of those do you uh, work with or hear your customers working with? I think this will be a very interesting question to see the results for. Yeah, we're definitely hearing two. Uh, some are doing one, uh, but two, and sometimes three for us, uh, from our customers. So. Okay, oh, interesting. Yeah, so similar, 20% uh, saw one, 60% uh, saw two and 10% saw three and 10% saw more than four. So yeah, very interesting. But yeah, typically we do see two. So uh, common pattern is uh, AWS and GCP or Azure with GCP. Uh, people seem to tend to like the Google Cloud Platform for advanced analytics. So, okay. And to wrap up my portion, just talking about, uh, you know, we talked about zero trust and also cloud monitoring. And these are some of the uh, capabilities that we provide from live action. So LiveNX is our, our, our platform that can monitor different portions of the network. We also have a service provider uh, capability and then our AI ops platform as well. And then uh, packet capture technologies. So this was from one of our acquisitions, but this is 25 years of packet analytics that could work in cloud or on premises. And we had a recent acquisition for encrypted traffic analysis, so ETA. So how do you not necessarily have to decrypt everything, but have a security detection and response capability? So uh, I think this is actually uh, of very uh, much interest from different portions of the government. And I think that's it for my portion. Caroline? Great, thank you, John. So now we're gonna hand it over to Craig Hartwell, the Chief Technology Officer at Presidio Federal. Uh, Craig, if you'd like to share your screen and John, you can hop off, thank you. Well, my preview is gonna just hope that I hit the right thing. Hey, John, while we're waiting for um, Craig, I can reframe this for him. Maybe one of the questions we can ask you about sure. zero trust, you know, is, is network monitoring a requirement for zero trust? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
So when you look at the NIST and DOD requirements documents, uh, it does call out uh, network monitoring. Um, so I would say it is, because uh, I think if to have a successful zero trust architecture, you do have to monitor and the network is a, a large component of that as well. So I would say yes. I'd be surprised if it, that you know, network monitoring doesn't come up in the discussion as a requirement. So. Yeah, and I, you know, when you're talking to customers, you're seeing this more and more. Are you you running into this? Uh, I know that definitely in the public sector, we get asked about this on the federal side. Uh, but uh, you're seeing that pervasively across industries these days. Yeah, it's it's not just government, uh, and you know, we work with DoD for so many years. Uh, they're always Know, assuming that you know the network's compromised and monitoring is so so critical for them, but yeah, even on the um, commercial side, uh, we hear more and more um, about zero trust. And and like I mentioned, that zero trust architecture, some of it is just kind of common sense, right? Encrypt everything, don't trust everything. Mm -hmm. uh, when you give resources access, you know, give it the, the least amount possible. I think um, it's just kind of um, natural to um, assume those types of um, capabilities. So. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's more, it's perhaps even more pronounced in some of the government installations as well. So um, becoming increasingly important. Yep, absolutely. Looks like we've got Craig back. Craig, do you have the slides or would you like John to pull them up? Um, yeah, I have them. Right. <clears throat> Let's let me. Uh... Yeah. Let me pull them up. All right. Let's see. Share. Beautiful. All right. You can start when you're ready. We good. Yep. All right, let me start at the beginning. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, everybody. Uh, you know, hey, I am the chief technology officer at Presidio Federal. Don't blame it on them. It's my stupid computer today. Um, uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, weather is really beautiful up and down the East Coast, so I appreciate your time here. Um, and the attendee list looks like it's full of really smart technical folks, which is really great. The technical content from live action is going to be really valuable for you guys, which probably means I shouldn't actually talk too much. Um, so I won't. In that vein, I only have a few slides and I only want to really convey two important thoughts about Presidio Federal. First one is what we do and the second one will be who we are. So what we do, first and foremost, our sole focus is supporting the federal government, strategies, initiatives, capabilities, transformation, all the big things that are driving government today. Um, and we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, Presidio uh, Federal, which was Presidio Government Solutions, has been around for over 40 years. So we are really entrenched here. As a result, we work with a lot of federal agencies, including the Census Bureau, the IRS, Department of Justice, Homeland Security, Defense Intelligence Services, National Geospatial Intelligence, the Social Security Administration, Military Health Services, more recently, and the Department of Defense, and lots of other people and tangentially. Uh, we also have a, access to a lot of vehicles um, and a several more in the pipeline. So. Fundamentally, we're very easy to reach for most agencies. And if you need quick turnaround on acquisition or services or one-stop shopping for everything from licenses and infrastructure to consulting architecture, design, deployment, and operations, we're your go-to. Um, and we can do this because of this partner network we have with, um, with so many good tech companies and OEM vendors. And um, live action exemplifies the technical acumen, domain expertise, and leading edge you know, thinking that we really seek out in our partners that enables us to provide holistic solutions to our customers. So they're experts and we're experts in kind of putting it all together. Um, everything we do is in support of digital transformation, which is we see as really the essential business transformation that leverages digital technology. And it's kind of where everything lands these days. We have six particular focus areas that uh, make up our capability stack, starting with IT modernization to enable high performance, on-prem and data center computing and networking, including the whole spectrum of wireless options, cloud, hybrid cloud and edge computing to match the client needs uh, for optimizing placement and security of workloads, data operations, 
automation and augmentation to increase accuracy, productivity, security, and efficiency. Um, I say you should automate everything you can and augment everything else. Uh, it's just, just everything at the speed of light today uh, demands that you really kind of step up. Cybersecurity, of course, cybersecurity being the, the, the driver um, for almost everything we have, the, the eight out of eight, 10 out of 10, 100% kind of, you know, have you heard about a, a zero trust come up in conversations is just kind of the thing. Um, it's like a year ago, it was Kubernetes and, and migration, and now it's zero trust and everything security. So um, it is definitely the driver behind pretty much everything we do these days, uh, including last but not least collaboration. Um, which boldly going where you know digital workplaces have never been before. With the latest collaboration technology from our OEM partners, we can build these extremely secure and sophisticated collaboration solutions that meet the needs of all the users and comply with all the regulations, which is now kind of the, the issue. Um, we're all working at home. We're all over the place. Collaboration is critically important to keep businesses going and changing the dynamic between agencies and citizenry and their customers inter inside of the federal government. And security becomes extremely important at that point, but you have all these endpoints. So zero trust kind of just went hand in glove with the whole transition that was going to have to happen anyway. So that what we do is important, but what I really want to leave you with is a sense of who we are. You can pretty much figure out what we do from our website, but you can't get a good sense of uh, you know, who we are or who you'd be working with as a customer or a partner of Presidio Federal. So here we are in a nutshell. Government is a business. The biggest difference between the federal government as a business and other businesses is the federal government isn't working for profit, but rather the security and safety and continuity of our country. So our mission statement reflects our commitment to facilitating that vision and mission with the federal government. I have many soapboxes because that's my job. Uh, three of the big ones that are mission, ownership, and opportunity. Aligning your technology initiatives with a transformation strategy and agency mission just makes really good business sense. Long-term success requires that our clients are able to take full ownership of their technology solutions, by which I mean that you need to be able to understand the alignment with the strategy, the vision, and the, and the, uh, um, the you know, long-term goals, how your IT systems support your business, and how to make good tactical and strategic decisions about the evolution of those systems, because digital transformation is never going to end. Um, not in our lifetimes, at least. So you need the long, you need the short game and the long game plan always in place. And there will always be opportunity for improvement. But you must plan your moves pretty carefully because you just can't adopt every new technology or capability that's going to come along. So Presidio Federal understands these issues and opportunities and works closely with our clients to maximize their strategic gain in the client's business. And we feel this job that we do, this vision that we share is of paramount importance. We're all feeling that now more than we have in decades. We have, I hope, survived a pandemic and we're, we're climbing our way back out of that, but it could have been much more disastrous and impactful than it was physically, culturally, and economically. And we see the threats to our safety and security increasing every day. We feel the pressure to be better prepared for the next crisis and to create much better security in both our government IT systems and in our nation's critical infrastructure. And there's being a, a lot of big money is being put behind these initiatives, which is just adding additional pressure to make wise spending decisions. So this is an unprecedented opportunity to make real gains in digital transformation. And that's why we're in this business. 2020 was a year that everyone, everything went sideways. And 2022 is the year we can get back on track. So Presidio Federal is determined to help our customers, our clients, and our country do just that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Craig. So now we're gonna move on to our panel questions hosted by Joe O'Connor from Live Action. Can you yeah, have my screen yeah. back? Here we go. Well, all righty, great. Well, Craig, while you were rebooting, we just asked the first question, um, you know, and John responded on, in terms of is network monitoring a requirement for zero trust? And you'll feel free to answer that one or we can move to the second one, it's up to you. I'll jump in. It's cool. Yeah. Um, I'm sure his answer was yes. If it wasn't, we have to burn him. Yeah, at the state. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, zero trust is fundamentally policy based um, and increasingly important. Um, you know, and in the future, zero trust is going to become much more dynamic. So, 
Um, you know, network monitoring is how you understand what's going on in an extremely sophisticated network environment and against so extremely sophisticated threats. Um, the products are becoming really good at detecting, you know, patterns and change over really long horizons of time, um, which is important given the sophisticated nature of the modern threat and automated threats. Um, John mentioned machine learning um, and the, you know, the, the complexity that they're seeing in the world. Uh, and that, that, that is what we're up against. We're up against things that are faster and smarter than the, you know, old world black hat hacker. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the real forcing functions is mobile devices. And we don't talk about this a lot, just, I don't know why, but it, it, it's, it's a thorn in the side of everything. And it's really difficult not to allow um, bringing your own device. And even MDM is not a guarantee you know, of, real, of perfect security either. So mobile devices become this major weakness and they propose a major threat. So you know, network traffic analysis that includes all the mobile devices and, the, you know, and edge devices and endpoints all over the place um, should really get special scrutiny. So yeah, I, that's the long answer to the yes. No, great, that's good. Um, let me, I'll go back to John on the second question. We'll just keep round robbing them. So John, what, what are the ways to monitor network traffic in cloud and, and is it different per cloud provider? Um, that's a good question. And from our perspective, you know, we see three ways. So one is the cloud native way of getting uh, flow logs and APIs from each cloud service provider. Uh, the second way is you know, inserting like packet analytics capabilities from the mirroring uh, from whether it's like an AWS or Azure uh, VTAP, for example, and then doing packet type uh, analytics. And the third is, you know, if you have uh, NFVs uh, running in there, like um, cloud firewall or CSR for SD-WAN edge, you know, being able to monitor that. Um, and between, for the cloud native one, uh, the, the cloud network constructs uh, and abstractions are somewhat similar. So when you think of a VPC, you know, uh, Google has you know, similar capabilities. Azure calls it something a little bit different, VNet, but we do find differences in like the telemetry that it sends, like a flow log in AWS looks more like a traditional um, IP fix or net flow from a router or switch. But from Azure, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more detail in some aspect, but less in others. But it, the one thing that's really interesting about Azure is They'll tell you what flow happened, but what security group policy entry it, it might have hit or not hit, for example. So if you're blocking some traffic, you know exactly which policy uh, was affected, was affecting that. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting, but we try to normalize as much as we can, or else, you know, if you make a different monitoring um, paradigm for each cloud vendor, then it becomes a nightmare for a customer because they have to change their the way of thinking when they're monitoring Azure versus uh, AWS. So we try to abstract it. Um, so I think that's one thing that's really interesting. We spend a lot of time abstracting cloud um, network architectures so that it's understandable. Like a VPC to us looks kind of like a, a supercharged router and we can mm -hmm. represent it like a router since you know it connects EC2 and other services and it's basically routing, but also providing security functions, but much like a router. Uh, so there's mm -hmm. things like, you know, uh, ACL that you can apply on interfaces, security group policies across the entire VPC, and you interconnect these. So we try to abstract that, whether you're using GCP, Azure, or AWS, so it's, so it's easier for our customers. Kind of a long answer, sorry. No, that's great. Yeah, and Craig, what, what would you take, any perspective on that from a Presidio perspective? Yeah, um, just, just one thing I wanna kind of add in there. Um, so one of the things you don't see exposed a lot from cloud providers, and it's because they're the cloud, are the, um, the changes that are happening at their infrastructure level, where, um, you know, they're, where they seek differentiation. Um, you know, I don't know how many years ago, but it wasn't very many years ago, there basically was only one or two clouds, and now there's lots of clouds, in a sense, and they're largely competing at the service level with common services and they're, and they're all pretty good at doing, doing a lot of the same things. It was small differences here and there. Um, AWS still cranking out stuff kind of faster than most people can, but in general, everybody's catching up. 
But one of the things that they, they are doing that they don't talk as much about to differentiate them internally is their own hardware infrastructure. Um, it, Google and AWS in particular are pursuing paths of their own custom hardware for lots of things. And some of that they expose and some of it they don't. Some of it's for customers and some of it's for them. Um, but that, that is going to that is going to impact this there mm-hmm. and, and, and it's, but it is incumbent upon them to expose what they need to expose at that level in their, in their network architecture um, to support this function. Now, I, I hope it does two things. I hope one, it helps, helps standardize this, this um, the need to kind of level set everything. So that everything has a common perspective of the customer. It'd be nicer if tool vendors, um, could rely on some standards so that they don't have to deal with the differences. Um, the other one being, I hope that their native tools become a lot better. They they are largely similar and do kind of you know same level of of things. Um, but these the potential architectural changes that could happen with custom hardware, specifically to support network performance and encryption and security. Uh, could dramatically change that. So it would be mm. nice to see the tools come along with those because that's how would you know that they were doing a superior job if they don't expose it at some level? Well, they won't expose it at the hardware level. They'll have to expose it at some sort of API level or service level. So I think that's yeah. going to be really interesting, but I'm just kind of looking into a crystal ball there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so, hey, let's, why don't I do the next question? We'll start with you, Craig, um, and then we'll toss it back to John if he's got something. So if you have a hybrid environment, how do you monitor both the cloud and the data center? Well, so every bring to, every vendor has their own insight monitoring, you know, and, and their own approach about it. Uh, but you'll usually, you, you'll always use some sort of single pane of glass for their scope and best in class products accept data from all kinds of sources. And then this is just kind of the, the, the world we live in that uh, you have to share the data because volume really counts. I mean, the network monitoring and security um, volume super counts. So you can't be you can't be selfish with this stuff. Eventually, and probably pretty soon, I think all such tools are going to have you know going to share data and results in standard ways, as I mentioned, um, and facilitate improved performance and security. Because it's just nice to play nice, and and that when you're the gorilla, you can get away with not. But nowadays, that's not uh, that's not really acceptable. So this is happening in other areas of IT as well. You know, you have lots of options. You can pick and choose best in class components and avoid vendor lock-in. So, you know, vendors have to try and find ways to play in, in the big sandbox with everybody else. But currently, um, you probably have multiple tools in play. Just That's just the way it is. Even if you go with a single network provider, you're going to deploy an architecture that has multiple tools in place. You know, John mentioned Cisco as a big partner. They're also a big partner of ours. Um, so we deploy a lot of Cisco environments. They have several components that monitor different aspects of the network and then pull it all together at one point. But that's just that's just the way you know product development goes. You you specialize a product to do a specialized function, and then you share the data to a, a, to common functions and, and common views of what's going on. And that's really important because you you need a single knock or sock as much as possible to cover as much of your IT environment as you can, um, because even with extensive automation. The teams that work in those centers are still really essential for the to, for the most resilient operations. And of course, bad behaviors that happen in one segment of your network can spill over into others. So crossing that boundary is extremely important. And right now, it's important for products like Live Action to be able to glue that stuff together. Yeah, well, that's great. Okay, thanks for that, Craig. Um, John, would you like me to restate the question if in a hybrid environment, how you monitor both cloud and DC? Yeah, so yeah, those are really good insights from Craig. And uh, like Craig mentioned earlier, every cloud provider has their own tools, but you know, trying to you know, manage a multi-cloud environment with on-premises with all these tools becomes uh, somewhat of a nightmare. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do is you know, trying to normalize that, but make it uh, usable for NetOps but also the you know there's the merging of NetOps and SecOps as well. So being able to share that data and uh, platform uh, with multiple stakeholders, I think, is important. And there's also this concept of data gravity. It's like there's a ton of information about the network on premises and the cloud, and you don't necessarily want to you know have to pull all that to one central location. So you know uh, I think there's there's an approach to make sure that 
um, a lot of the heavy lifting and analytics stay in those particular domains. And data privacy, you know, also comes up uh, at some point as well. So, you know, kind of leaving that data where it is is, is helpful. Um, so for us, you know, uh, doing a lot of the processing for on-premise, on-premise, and then having the, the analytics uh, in the cloud where necessary, uh, where it's closer to the data source becomes uh, an issue too. And then at the end of the day, it's really, you know, there's an application problem uh, uh, or there's a security incident. And then you got to get all the stakeholders together. And that's where it becomes important that you have on-premise uh, and cloud visibility to segment. Uh, otherwise, you just start pointing at each other and then everybody takes out their favorite tool and says, you know, this is where the problem is. But you got to kind of have to come to a, a meeting of the mind at some point. Yeah. All right. That's great, John. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'm going to toss this, this next question up and, and who choose, I mean, either one of you can answer it first. Um, so you, so it was mentioned that encrypted traffic analysis is, is more important recently. Does that involve decryption? Um, I don't know who wants to start with that one. I'll let John go first because he's got the fancy new tool. Uh, and I'll just bring in some perspective. <laughs> okay, great. Go for it, Craig. Oh, I said John, but that's okay. Oh, go no, say oh. you said John. Go, go, no, John. Because he's got the fancy tool. <laughs> I was going to say, okay. Yeah, so encrypted traffic analysis is, is kind of an interesting topic. Um, and yeah, we just acquire a company called Counterflow that you know, spends a lot of time uh, doing machine learning and AI. Uh, in this area. And you know, there's different levels of ETA or encrypted traffic analysis. And one is you know, just simplistic. And, and the part of the problem is, as you adopt new encryption technologies like TLS 1.3, uh, it's very, very difficult to you know, decrypt everything because every session has a different key. Uh, before in the past, it was easier because you can have one certificate or um, and, and then be able to decrypt all the the traffic that's necessary, but now it's much more dynamic. So doing ETA uh, on the, without decrypting um, is a much more scalable, easy to deploy type solution, but there's also different levels of uh, encrypted traffic analysis. So simplistically, you can look at like the five tuple and you know, look at the duration of something or total bytes or packets. So, and use that to identify you know, certain types of traffic but it's not that uh, useful to some extent and be able to identify you know, zero day attacks, for example. Um, but you could go one more level up where you start leveraging information about DNS, as long as DNS is not encrypted, uh, cipher suites, uh, TLS extension types, and things like um, fingerprinting. So J, there's a JA3 fingerprinting. So during the um, TLS communication, you can extract certain um, features of that and then use that as a fingerprint. So for example, certain applications will have a, a unique fingerprint on how they do that type of communication. So we see that as like a bin level uh, encrypted traffic analysis. And what we do is um, what we call deep packet dynamics. So we not only do those uh, earlier uh, ETA uh, type uh, techniques, we, but we apply machine learning to really look at that entire encrypted traffic pattern. Uh, and it's looking at the sequence of packets, the length of those packets uh, over time, and really understand you know, what that profile is. Um, so for example, if you're running Salesforce, it's going to have a certain pattern to it. Uh, you know, how does it start up? How do the users typically interact? versus uh, YouTube, uh, just assuming that these are all encrypted using HTTPS. So they would have totally different looking patterns, but we would know what a YouTube pattern looks like over time. Uh, how does it actually perform? Uh, what are the, what's the producer versus consumer ratio of traffic, like uh, sending versus receiving? So if there's malicious traffic that's pretending to be Salesforce or YouTube, to be much easier to identify because it doesn't fit the normal pattern uh, that we you know, applied machine learning to, for example. But you know, just looking at you know, uh, other features uh, 
without having to decrypt gives you a lot of information, but it's also a lot of features that you have to plug into your model to really understand. But over time, the models get you know, better and, and more improved and they'll realize or they'll get uh, acclimated to your environment. So they see something that's supposed to be a particular app, but it doesn't behave normally. Uh, and then correlating that with other threat intel information just helps uh, ETA be much more effective. Okay. And Craig, what, what do you think? What would you add to that? Yeah, so um, John's right. There, there's quite a bit that you can do with uh, without decrypting. Um, and I, and I, but as the honest broker um, and the hard nose, we're going to say that the, the the NIST allowance for non, uh, you know, for encrypted traffic analysis is because they they have to make that compromise. If if NIST demanded that the federal government decrypt all their traffic to analyze it, they crash the government uh, and that'd be the end of it um so it, it's 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 gonna it's gonna be an allowance for a while i mean we're not going to go overhaul all of the, the federal government it systems and networks to you know make it possible to do full decryption but it's ultimately going to be the only way to truly combat all the sophisticated threats um and the, the volume problem that john mentioned is is really critical machine learning demands massive amounts of data. So you hear about data lakes and, and, and the amount of data that a general enterprise produces is by comparison, extremely small compared to giant data lake applications that use machine learning. And the studies that have been done with machine learning doing kind of automated and anomaly detection in network traffic have, most, have mostly shown that it has huge promise, but the false positives just drive the sock insane. So it's it's not um, it's not quite there yet. There's there's just there's so much we have to learn, and there's so much volume of data needed to train um, and and feed the machine learning to make it you know kind of um, performant in its own right as an from an accuracy perspective. So definitely something we have to do. I mean, you want to do all these levels anyway. You want to do as much as you possibly can. Um, since we can't decrypt everything, we won't decrypt everything. But we need to keep pushing forward on that. And we're starting to see the network um, hardware manufacturers stepping up to that because of the continued demand for performance on the network under heavy overhead, like decryption and other kinds of stuff that are happening on the network. Um, so Cisco, Palo Alto, you know, the big names in the network industry, they're putting out these powerhouse devices that run on the networks specifically to handle this problem so that you can kind of you know, keep the network running at its at its at its you know at its best while you're while you are pulling a lot of data off and decrypting it and trying to do analysis in real time. Um, but ultimately, uh, decryption is going to be extremely important for recognizing extremely sophisticated threats, not just the kind of anomalous behavior type stuff, but these things are really sophisticated, um, and it's going to be difficult to catch some of the really serious ones because they know you're doing what you're doing so spy versus spy just kind of constantly ups the game for everybody um and back to my comment on you know what i think cloud providers are doing with unique architectures and custom hardware i, I think that's where a lot of this is going to end up going i even see that with the network providers you know this specialized hardware for this stuff um so the new capability is going to be there maybe the next generation to handle the massive scale and the enhanced analyst analysis that we need and, uh, you know, it's particularly in the government, CISA has a, um, you know, data collection um, process to kind of gather a lot, a lot more data. In other words, it's not agency by agency anymore. They realize that they need that volume to kind of get them where they want to be. So, yeah, yeah right. um, it involves decryption as much as you can. Um, you avoid it when you have to. Great. Well, thanks, Craig. So I got we got one last question in two minutes. I'm wondering if maybe I think it's all John, because uh, I asked the question. <laughs> John, John, I think Craig would like to know this question as much as I do. So sing. So John, I'll give you maybe a elevator two sentence thing around it, and then we'll see where we go with the follow up. Single pane of glass is such an important term. Can you provide some insight on the importance of what that means? And um, we'll just leave it with you, and then we'll instruct everyone how to get follow-up information? Yeah, I think it goes back to, you know, uh, being able to see 
And when you have all the different types of teams and stakeholders involved in solving you know, a really hard problem, whether it's application performance or if it's a security issue, you know, having that single pane of glass is very important and segmenting the problem. So you know, people that get visibility on the cloud will say, you know, there's nothing wrong there, fine. But you still need to get visibility on the on-premise side. And when you throw SD-WAN in the mix, it's like, how do you get this end-to-end -end picture? And then for really hard problems, it's, it's very important that you get that uh, complete picture and it's just really quicker mean time to repair or um, solving uh, that security incident. So I think it's actually very uh, critical. That's kind of my short answer. Excellent, thanks. I know we pressed you on time there, John. Thank you both. Caroline, would you like to sum how folks can get further information? With that, I'd like to thank all of our participants as well as John and Craig and Joe for being with us today. Uh, we hope that the information that you all received today has been helpful. So thank you all for being here and have a wonderful rest of your day.